are starting our freedom series, Freedom from Sin is this morning's topic. And this really what I want to talk to you about is freedom from secret sin. Somebody say secret. How many know we are only as sick as our secrets? You see, we had a very unfortunate event happen in our church this week with some secrets. Some secrets that were involving some crimes. Some secrets that were involving years and years and years of, of addiction and, and of, of crimes against children. And it, it devastated me. And I remember I, I called Jack on Wednesday morning and I said, I really, I don't feel right about this. I want to get this guy into treatment. I just, I'm, I'm really torn and he gave me the best counsel. He said, well, what are you legally bound to do? And sometimes we want to go outside of God's law to protect people. And we want to go outside of man's law to protect people. And really, I put myself in jeopardy. And so I called the conference and I called the, the big Methodist gurus that are in charge of this. And she said, you know what? She said, if you would have waited one more day, they could have pressed charges on you. And listen, I don't love any of y'all enough to go to jail Except for maybe the jacks, the, the jack of hearts and the jack of spades, because he takes little digs at me every once in a while. Okay, so, I'm kidding. Look, everybody's like, oh no. No. We all have chains. Somebody say amen. Some of us are blessed enough to have dropped our chains, but we all have chains. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, freedom from chains is the most important freedom we can have. You see, I've got this bucket here, and, and these are full of filthy, dirty chains. And see, what we want as Christians is we want this right here. We, we, some of us like to sit in our own chains. Some of us like to sit in our misery. I say that people are addicted to chaos. And now, how do you feel? Bondage. Pretty bondage. Seriously. There's, I don't think you're, you're enjoying yourself. No. Your cheeks are red, your forehead's red, your neck is red. And then this, this around your neck is not comfortable, right? Because I can see it's pinching your skin. And see, what we do is then what we do is we make the mistake. We think, well, look, try to walk. Oh, look. He, it's not bad, right? But see, then what happens is the more we sit in bondage, then the bigger chains come out. And then what happens is the enemy convinces us we're self-empowered. We can get out of these chains by our own might. And so as we start to, we start with one leg, we start with two legs, and then pretty soon, pretty soon, what's going to happen? I swear if you pass gas, I'm not going to forgive you. So put your legs together. I'm pulling your legs together. And then what happens is, how many know if we can't talk about passing gas in church, we can't talk about it anywhere? All right, some of you are like, I'm never coming back. He said pass gas. Okay, so now you can still kind of walk, right? If you kind of, not comfortably, right? Right. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to put this up around your neck so that now your bondage is now based on how you're going to walk and how you're going to get through life. And so it's going to get very uncomfortable very quickly because what we do is we put ourselves in these situations there's a lot more chains in there, and it's going to get worse. So here's the problem, though. So now, now that he's bound, and I have this chain, and I have this chain, I can drag him anywhere I want to go. And what's he going to do? See, now he's just a puppet. Because if I pull him off of this stage, there's nothing he can do to stop me. I don't care how strong. I don't care how tough Chase is. I don't care... When he goes through a green light, he purposefully spins his truck out and does these maneuvers, and he says they're on accident, but he really did it on purpose. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> this guy, this guy here, I had a ball getting to know this guy. But listen, what you're seeing here, this might be funny, and it might be funny, and it's not. Because today, on Monday, John and I were in the prayer room, and a young man came in just like this. And he was being pulled, and he was being pulled. And this is what we saw. And then when he started to tell his story, these chains came out. 
And as John was explaining, he couldn't understand why it was so heavy, why his burden. And these chains weren't even locked. He could get them off anytime he wanted. And he had talked to John and he had talked to these people over and over and over and over and over. And he had explained to them. And John said, well, you never told me that. You, these chains that you were talking about, you, just, you started adding stuff. Just today, you started adding stuff. And he just kept heaping these chains. Now, how does that feel? Miserable. His face is getting pale. It's tight around his neck. And let me show you something. Now when I put this combination lock on there, he's really going to get uncomfortable. And so as I put this combination lock on there, what I want you to understand about all these is these combination locks, there's no combination except in Jesus Christ. The only person who has this combination, see he uses guys like John Tadlock in the deliverance ministry, but John has to know where the gates are. See, Jesus can just take them off. But here's the problem, church. What we are seeing as the enemy gets closer and closer and closer to the end of the world is we keep picking these chains back up. So now I want you to try to walk with, with as much effort as you can. Why is that so difficult? Because earlier you were sort of giggling and now you're having to keep your balance. Why is that so hard? A lot of chains. A lot of chains. And when we worshiped earlier and it said, there's nothing too dirty. John and I blushed. And listen, I was in the army with some filthy dudes. But the things that he was telling us, we looked at each other like, forget making a sailor blush. This would make bikers blush. He said some things that were just, and then I started to get enraged about his chains. I started to get angry about his chains. And how many know it takes what it takes? Your rock bottom is different than mine. You've got to get to the point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. See, I'm, I believe in recovery. I don't believe in punishment. And so what I did was I talked to the, the sheriff's department and I said, can we send this guy to treatment? That's okay. Go ahead. So can we send this guy to treatment? And he said, yeah. If he'll go, to, go, to, go ahead and go to treatment, you see how, see how the darkness, yeah. see that? Yeah. There it goes. Hey, we got some praying women in this church that would like to just turn the lights back on. <laughs> so, do whatever you got to do to, that's going to look really cool for you YouTubers out there. You're going to think I did that on purpose. Or you're gonna... Obviously, some of you need to hear this message and some force out there doesn't want you to hear it. So, as we see these chains, they're heavy. And now, here's the craziest part. Even in this illustration, he's going to have to go and have somebody help him get these chains up because they have combinations on the back. Yeah. And if he doesn't have the combination, it's funny, but he can't get out of them. Right. Unless he has bolt cutters that somebody's willing to go get out of his truck. We can joke and we can laugh about the illustration. We can sit here and go, well, you know, this is just part of the show. <clears throat> this is just part of the spectacle. But he really can't get out of these chains without help. Right. And that's what we are here for, is to help one another. See, there is no division in Christ Jesus. There is no division. It doesn't matter what denomination you are, or what sect of denomination you are, or what type of... I'm a Metacostal. But listen, I love hardline first Methodists. I do. I love them. I love the liturgy. I love that. I love the Lutherans and the Episcopals. I love the crazy Pentecostals. I love the people that run the whole service. I love Catholics. Why? Because we're just different flavors of the same ice cream. We start out with the same base. And if you've ever been to a, an ice cream factory and you see how it's made, it's all the same base. We're just different flavors. So before you condemn somebody and before you think, well, their church is this and their church is that, who cares? Because this is what matters. Right. It's freedom from chains. It's watching people. And how many of you have seen people who walk around in this posture? They walk around defeated. And don't you think it's because this is what they're carrying? I don't mean to get preachy. But it's my third visit here and they made me. Some of you are going to get that on the way home and they're going to go, Oh my goodness, that was funny. Chase. 
I hope that Jack or Jackie will sit here and twist these and get the combination. It goes two full turns, 18, one to the left, 27, 13. But some of these, anyway, I want to thank you, Chase, for being my guinea pig. If I ruined your shirt, I'll get you another one. But listen, as Chase walks off this stage, he cannot do it without help. Did you notice how these men came up without me saying, and I wanted to see what would happen without, if I didn't say something. But Walt and Jack came up, why? Because he would have fell on his face and some of you would have laughed like you laugh at people. Look, you raised your hand, thank you for being honest. We have one honest person. Jackie would have giggled and then she would have came and helped. Because that's what she did when I was exhausted and they kept talking and, and keeping me awake and I was like, it's 5 a.m., please, please. So, let me get into my message. That was just the illustration. That was just the hors d'oeuvres. That was just the appetizer. You see, I want to explain how chains work. I want to understand how easy it is to pull and manipulate when you use chains. I was driving down the road and this guy cut me off right by First Assembly, Panama City First Assembly. And he cut me off and ran me off the road and my car went into the ditch. And I said, Jesus! And it stopped. And it, it was, I was on two wheels. And people got out and they were like, don't move. I have pictures of it. I should have, I should have put them up on the screen. I have pictures of it. And, and, and they said, don't move, don't move, don't move. And two guys came and they, they kept their hands like this so it wouldn't go into the ditch. And if you've been by First Assembly in Panama City, you know what I'm talking about. There's a huge ditch there. And it goes in, if I would have hit that ditch, I would have been dead. And they came and they kept their hands there and then the other guy helped me pull and I'm, I only weigh 145 pounds so it was easy to pull me out. But see, now you're laughing because I'm chubby. You should be ashamed, ashamed of yourself. When White's record service, which by the way, they didn't pay me for that advertisement, but they were incredible. I was broke as a joke at the end of the month and he said, that's gonna be $150. And I said, I got $50. And he said, well, pastor, and I didn't even tell him. Now, it helps when you wear a priest collar everywhere you go. But, and I don't just do that for the freebies. Uh, I do that because this is my, my battle dress uniform. This is my war uniform. This is what I wear to go into battle. So, when you pull and you manipulate, he hooked up this chain. And the chain wasn't that big. And I sat there, and look at this. This, is, this illustration isn't even over yet. They're struggling to get these off of him. Why? Because they've got to be broken off. They've got to be taken off. See, this is how I live my life. Ask Jack, ask Jackie, ask Christine, ask everything I turn into a sermon. Everything. I'll be at Starbucks and I'm like, white mocha? Oh, praise the Lord. And people are like, what? Well, think about it. Ridiculous, I know, but that's the way my brain works. So what is your chain or chains? What's keeping you bound or locked up? Check this out. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now I don't know about you, but that scene in Braveheart gets me jacked up all the time. And I, and I made the sound instead of, the, I didn't want you to concentrate on the beautiful makeup and the beautiful hair and the kilts. I wanted you to concentrate on the words. That if we fight, we may die but wouldn't you trade it all for just a chance? And Chase, now that you're sitting there, you're still kind of pale, but what does it feel like to now be free? Because you were getting nervous. I was watching you over here out of the corner of my eye, and there was a few times Jack was having to twist it, and you're like, whoa, 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 don't twist too hard. Because when we finally do get free, there's nothing like it. You walk a little different. I have a friend who's in this recovery program with me, and when I, first, when I first got sober, and when I first gave up everything, and when I first stopped popping pills, and I, I, I went from being a victim to a victor, we went to Walmart in Callaway, and I couldn't even look people in the eye. If you can imagine, people say, I can't imagine that. But I didn't talk much, and, and when I did talk, I cried a lot, and I was just so broken. And I'm walking in there, and this guy's in his 70s, and he jabs me in the ribs, and he said, man, you're with me. How dare you look at the ground? You're with me. Get your head up. You got nothing to be ashamed of. 
You see, it's brokenness that gets us into freedom. See, the chains have to be broken. John Tadlock told this young man, you're lying, and if you don't tell me where the gates are at, I can't shut them. But see, secret sin keeps us where it's impossible for anyone to help you. You're stuck on the side of the road. You know exactly what's wrong with your car, and when I pull over to help you, you go, "Uh, I'm okay. You okay? Right? And that's what we say. How are you doing? When someone asks me how I'm doing, I don't say fine if I'm not doing fine. This is what I usually say. Do you really want to know or are you just making chit-chat? And 99% of people say chit-chat. I say, well, then I'm fine. But sometimes I'm not fine. Sometimes, sometimes I'm, I, I feel like I want to punch something. And, and in this recovery program I'm in, we have what's called a sponsor. And it's someone who's made strides in recovery that chooses to share their experience, strength, and hope with each other, with other people that are in recovery so that we can, we can glean off of them. We have a guy that says, you don't believe in God, borrow mine for a week and then come back and tell me. Borrow my God for a week. We have another guy who says, maybe God is just good orderly direction. And you know what? For someone who's a bottom line addict and alcoholic, that's, sometimes that's all they can handle. See, we're on, we are humans. We are not humans on a spiritual journey. We are spirits on a human journey. That gets me jacked up. That gets me excited because I realize that this chubby shell is just temporary. Really, I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but what would have happened if he gave me that shell? I would have been arrogant. I would have been too confident. I wouldn't be as meek and humble as I am right now. And the problem with me is I'm too humble. But you know what? My buddy Ken taught me something that set me free. I used to walk around and and all these Christians would say, you're not humble, you're arrogant, you're not humble. And, And Ken told me this. He said, humbleness is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And so I think of myself less a little more today than I did yesterday. And it's progress, not perfection. You see, Christianity is not the answer. Because everybody's a Christian. Becoming a follower of Christ and being sold out and being willing to every step when you, when you take that chain, because listen, God doesn't put chains on us. We do. The enemy just holds them out in front of us and we go, okay, I'll take that. And sometimes we go, well, that one's better than this one. That one's cleaner than this one. We make excuses and we say, well, I'm not as bad as that other guy. So I'll be all right. The cost of freedom is simple. Check this out. John 8, verse 31 through 36 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you shall abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm trying to get us out of here at a decent time, so please, I'm I'm excited, so bear with me. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You see, I have a higher power who I choose to call Yahweh. I have a higher power who I choose to call Jesus Christ. But I love Hindus. I love Buddhists. I love atheists. For me, it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist, and I admire that. Think about that on the ride home, and then you'll go, you'll do what we call the nose blow. Hmm. 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 That That was pretty funny. Hmm. Sometimes that's all I get. My dad humor, my kids are like, no, terrible. I believe God has given me a word this morning that's gonna break chains and free slaves. What would happen if you could leave this place free from everything that's got you chained up, choked out, bound, and enslaved? If you could be free, what would you do tomorrow? How would freedom change you? See, I'm so excited about this freedom series because we've made plans. There's five weeks in January. We've made plans. You see, I'm not one of the Methodist pastors that goes, well, I have to have this suit 
and I have to have a clothing allowance, and I have to have this, and I don't share my pulpit except for four times a year because this is my therapy. Listen, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. There's nothing that I won't do. Now, I've got health issues and back issues and all that, so please don't call me to lift up. I'm not gonna help you move because then I won't be able to do anything else for the rest of the week. And my kids all the time are like, really, should you be doing that? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be okay, and then I'm not okay. So, but I am here to serve the people in whatever capacity they need me. This isn't my pulpit. And by the way, I noticed that some of you looked at this pulpit like, it's not the right pulpit. But see, I'm a big guy, so this makes me feel small. I actually get to feel like Chase's size standing next to this. And the other one made me feel like I'm all, me likey. That's how it made me feel. So I'm excited because in the next coming weeks, this next week we have freedom from doubt with the Jacks or the Jack attacks or the house that Jack built that Jackie lets him build is what I call it. (laughs) Jack and Jackie Westine will be tag team preaching next Sunday. The third week, we have freedom from chained perspective with a dear friend of mine, Pastor Clayton Lassiter, who I was his kids minister in Honeyville. He's now been appointed to City Lights, a new church start. So when he comes, don't let him recruit you. Don't let him ask you to leave. Tell him no. Pastor Seven already warned us. The fourth week, we'll be talking about freedom from debt. Somebody say yeah. Yeah. You see, when God put us in the Garden of Eden, he didn't mean for us to break our backs in labor. He meant for us to just commune with him. He meant for us to walk in the cool of the evening. See, growing up, I thought God's name was Andy. I really did because Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. So growing up, I think I was in third or fourth grade when some kid said, his name's not Andy. It's and he. And I went, oh. There's also no Starbucks in the Bible, even though there is Hebrews. So the fourth week, we'll be doing Freedom of Debt, where we invite you to bring your physical debt, your emotional debt, and your financial debt to the altar. And we're going to have a cylinder, and I don't know, Jack's probably going to tell me I can't do this, but I want to light fire to your debt. Whether I know some of you are so paranoid about written, look, Ken's like, no, you are not doing that. He's like, I'm a fire marshal, and I will shut this place down. So I promise we won't burn it down. Maybe we'll do it in Reformation Hall because it's already on fire. So (laughs) finally, week five, we are doing freedom from sickness and disease and fear and resentment and unforgiveness. That's when I invite you to go out and get people in wheelchairs and go out and get the deaf and go out and get the blind and get them here because it's not about me. And it's not about this amazing worship team. It's not about this building. It's about the body of Christ surrounding people with love. And it's, and it's about the Matthew 10, 8, where it says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, raise the dead. See, I have faith enough. I have faith enough. So when I go up to people, and I've been doing it all week, I've been going up to people. I went up to a young man who was in a wheelchair that, was, that had muscular dystrophy, and I said, do you believe God can heal you? He said, yeah. I said, come. And he said, I will. And his dad looked at me and he said, you know, nobody talks to him, they talk to me. Nobody talks to him, they talk to me. And he said, I just want to scream. He's, he's a person. How old is he? Oh, what, 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 what? And he's like, talk to him. It's devastating what people walk around with. It's devastating to see the chains that we walk around with. So don't miss any of July. Be sure to invite your friends. So today we're gonna explore how to get rid of these chains and I'm going long and if you need to leave, I will not be offended. But if you wanna stay, it's gonna be well worth it. So Pastor Allen's probably gonna send me an email that's like a little long-winded. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So today we are gonna talk about how to get rid of them, how to get rid of these chains, how to break them. I'm gonna talk like the Micro Machine guy so I can get through all my notes. Break them or lose them, and better yet, shatter them, amen? So check this out, Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When Jesus says do not, or Paul says do not, or God says do not, that's not a suggestion. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Why did he say again? Because they keep picking it up. Stop! 
In my Bible, Galatians 5, 1 is under the, te- the title Christian Liberty. That's good. See, tomorrow's the 4th of July. We celebrate independence from England. And I happen to like English people, so I don't know the big deal. But what I'm saying is today can be your independence day. July 3rd can be something. See, we have a sobriety date. Today can be your liberty date. Today can be your chain date. That every year you celebrate this date when you gave up that bondage. And I'm talking about bondage that nobody knows about. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about emotional abuse that you put onto your family and your spouse. I'm talking about belittling each other. I'm talking about stuff nobody wants to talk about. I'm talking about sexual sin that nobody knows about and they'll never find out. I'm talking about pride and hidden racism and hidden prejudice. I'm talking about things that nobody wants to talk about and that most of you are looking at me like, oh, he's not supposed to talk about that. But listen, church, if I can't talk about it here, they're sure gonna talk about it out there. We went over to Jack's for my son's birthday party. I asked, and it was pretty, pretty probably nervy of me to just meet somebody and say, can I use your pole? But we went over there, and, and my son Gunner has this friend named AJ, and he's hilarious. His parents are very staunch, like NRA carrying hunters. And without skipping a beat, Jack said, Hey, buddy, hey, buddy, what's your name? And he goes, Susie. Straight face, am I kidding? And he goes, Excuse me? And he goes, It's Susie. And he goes, Today I identify as Susie. And nobody laughed but me because he teases his family like that. He's like, I think today I'm going to identify as Susie and his dad and his mom are just like, no, you are not. And this is a kid who gives me little treats. He's got blueberries all over his house and he'll pick blueberries for me. And he'll say, here, here, seven, here, Mr. Seven, here's some blueberries for you. But that day he gave us a valuable lesson that it's real. There are kids who wake up and whose parents encourage them to identify as whatever they want. There's a lot of males out there that identify as men that aren't men. And all you single ladies, all you single ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, ooh, he just sang Beyonce in the church. Okay, so, you see, if you ain't got freedom, then you ain't got nothing. See, bound people, bind people. Broken people, break people. Hurt people, hurt people. But guess what? Free people, free people. See, found people... They go and find people. It needs to be like a multi-level marketing. You need to get something inside of you that's so good, there's a Culver's up here that just got put into Panama City Beach. And if you know what Culver's is, you got excited when you saw that. See, Culver's is in Tennessee and Kentucky and all over the place. When my kids saw Culver's, they have a flavor of the day of this custard that's just smack your mama good. And listen... He, my, my 12-year-old, my 15-year-old, my 8-year-old daughter goes, you know what? Culver's is here. It's turtle. Can we go to Culver's? Can we? Now I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm not going to hear the end of it. But they get so excited, they tell people about it. If you're not excited about Jesus Christ, you may not be a Christian. If you're not so excited that when your friends at work go, you know what? I can't stop smoking crack. And you go, that's a shame. You got the answer. You know the combination. And if you're not willing to share that with them, there's something seriously wrong with you. See, the Lord, I was in the prayer room and the Lord revealed to me that a lot of Christians are gonna have to get saved. And that's scary. And, and, and especially as a new pastor on my first week to tell Christians that they need to get saved, that's, that's scary. But there's a difference between a Christian and a disciple and you're gonna hear me say that for the next 25 years, Lord willing. Listen to these verses. This is Pastor Seven talking. This is, this is me, this is, my, this is my viewpoint, but this is God's word. The spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. This is me, I'm taking this on. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of 
righteousness, the planning of the Lord that he may be glorified. See, that's Isaiah 61, verse one through three. Sometimes I say these things and people go, man, that's good. Is that Shakespeare? I say, no, that's Jesus. Shakespeare took it from Jesus. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, oh, 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 listen, this is when you should listen. All the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Aren't you tired of biting each other? Aren't you tired of consuming each other? Aren't you tired of young men who come into this place and, and, and after a while when they see you guys act the same way as every other church and every other place, they go, I don't want this. See, in recovery, we tell people, if you want what we have, you got to do what we did. I want the church to get to a place. If you want the Jesus that I got, you got to serve the Jesus that I got. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's a big responsibility. That means your walk, you better be chain free. So check this out. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. What fruit did you have then in these things, which you are now, now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. See, sometimes when people witness and they do the Romans road, they, they leave out the good stuff. They just give them just a, just a bite. I like to get people full like Jackie's pancakes. I like to get people where she's like, you want another one? And I'm like, oh, Lord, no. You see, I'm free. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm free. And if you're not free, if you're not free, look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to get free. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So if I haven't offended you this morning by the way I look or that I'm not wearing shoes, I think you might get offended in just a little bit. I'm from the West Coast. I'm originally from Arizona, but I've spent most of my life in California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada. I'm a West Coast kid. And in the West Coast, I look normal. I'm actually pretty conservative. If anybody's spent any time around Newport Beach or Los Angeles, you know that I, I'm, 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 like a, I'm like a Joe Christian. Seriously. I look pretty normal. But to some of you, I look pretty crazy. In this conference, I'm already known as, well, he's that, guy. He's that weird guy that has the spiky tattoos and the earrings. And they asked me to take my earrings out for this thing. And they, they asked me to cover my arms up. And you know what? I did what I had to do to get here, to get home. But I'm not hiding anymore. You see, because when I go out and I witness to somebody who has tattoos, they look at my priest collar, they look at my tattoos, and they go, can we talk? This is just who I am. I started getting tattooed when I was 16 years old because it was cultural. I look normal. Y'all look weird. I, I asked Jack, I said, now you ride with the tribe of Judah. How many tattoos? He's like, I don't have a single tattoo. And I said, we're going to change that. You can't ride a motorcycle with no tattoos. That's not cultural. And he was like, no, no, you're right. The, all the guys, that, all the outlaws, all these guys. And I was like, I'm, I'm telling you, in the West Coast, when you get to the coast, I spent some time in New York City. I, am, I look like a prep in Manhattan. And if any of you have been there, you know there's people barking. There's a guy that doesn't wear any clothes. He just wears this thing that says, you know, God's coming back. He's crazy. Now, I'm crazy See, I'm here because I'm not all there. Some of you will get that on your ride home. You're going to be eating lunch, and you're going to go, meh, 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 meh. Okay. So you laugh. You laugh about what I'm telling you, but I'm serious. The West Coast has a lot more weird people than Florida, so I don't stick out so much in the West Coast. And maybe it's just me, but I've always been that kind of weird person. I've always felt like I didn't fit in. I've always been peculiar. See, I was set apart at a very young age, and I started singing, and I started rapping in church at a very young age. And as a very young kid growing up in a Baptist church and going to Baptist camps and doing Baptist stuff, they said, that's great, but don't do it here. 
And so what I did was I started to go and I, I went to a program called Master's Commission and I went through a program called Pastor's College and that's my first drink, can you believe that? I'm sitting here going, why am I so thirsty? That's why, isn't that funny? You have not because you ask not. Maybe it's just me, but I've always been that weirdo. I've always felt like I didn't fit in. My approach to evangelism is weird too. See, I wanna reach people absolutely any way possible. So when school starts back up, we're gonna have a back to school bash, and I wanna give you guys just a little preview of what we're gonna do. And so, I'm gonna turn this microphone on because Check, check. See, every rapper has to have this kind of microphone. For those of you that don't know, I used to tour at the United States as a gospel rapper, and uh, I've come out of retirement because my, my homie Chase right there, he said, now Jack says you rap, and I, I did some rapping for him, and he was like, whoa. So Jack said, would you rap on Sunday morning? And he said, if people leave, they're going to leave, and that's okay, and then we'll find out who really wants to go to church here and who doesn't, and so that's okay. So if you play that track, kick that funky beat, homeboy. We're going to get into this, and we're going to praise God through rap music, and then I think we're going to be done. I think, I think we're good. Turn it up as loud as they'll, until they start doing this. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So how many know you're either going to live forever, or you're going to die forever? You're either going to live forever, hear what I'm saying, or you're going to die forever.
to the lost. And if you don't approve of that or you don't approve of the way that I look or the way that I preach or the way that I act or the way that God uses me, I invite you to find another place to worship. And that may sound terrible, but I don't want you here if you're not called to be here. When visitors come in here, I don't want there to be division between you and your shepherd, you and your pastor. You see, because what I've been explaining to Jack and Jackie is they are my associate pastors. You see, Beth and and Calvin are prayer pastors. Christine's not a worship leader. She's a worship pastor. Jonathan's not just yoked for no reason. He's not just ripped with his big Filipino. I think he just eats just chicken gristle, and that's it. But Jonathan is a drum pastor. See, we need to understand that there's going to be young men who come into the church that say, I want to play drums. So Jonathan is going to be able to take them through discipleship in exchange for drum lessons. See, everything has a cost. Because if it costs you nothing, then it's worth nothing. See, Jackie King, I had a terrible mother growing up. And this morning she said, can I give you a mom hug? And I almost fell. When she held me, and I'm not a crier. And I couldn't start crying because I'm one of those women like Tammy Faye Baker where my mascara starts running. But I was literally in her arms and she said, just like one of my boys, I'm going to tell you, baby, it's going to be okay. And let me tell you something. If she can do that for me, imagine broken women and imagine broken young men who come in here and go, I need a job. And I say, you know what? Go work with Jack. Go sweat and labor. Because men need to learn how to be men. Pastor Allen gave me a charge that we need a men's ministry where males learn how to be men. I'm almost done, I promise. So now that I've shocked your cerebral cortex and caused an earthquake of broken stereotypes, let's get down to business. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to reach the lost? See, I was told that this church, there was going to be people who left, and then there would be no room left. Get what I'm saying? There's going to be people who left, but then there's going to be no room left. We're going to have to go to two and three services because people feel free when they come in here. And see, they say, well, people don't respond to altar calls because you don't have influence or they don't know you or they're not used to you. And I said, baloney. People don't respond to altar calls because of their own insecurities and because they're afraid of what we're going to say or think. I want to get to a place where I can respond to my own altar call and I don't care what anybody thinks. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. You don't have the right to stay in chains if you are a believer and a follower of Christ. You have to drop those chains. Because why would anybody want what you have if you walk around just like them? Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm reading to you that again. Listen to what I'm saying. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1, if you don't believe me, go look it up. He's saying you don't have the right to look at pornography. You don't have the right to be a liar. I'm a serial exaggerator, because I like to tell fish stories. And so Jack's really good at saying, yeah, that happened, Jackie, but not like that. It wasn't that. He didn't throat punch the guy. He just put his hand on his shoulder. But see, the throat punch is more Bruce Willis, so I always like to pump things up. I'm working on it. That's my secret sin. I'm confessing it right now. I'm dropping that chain. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may be put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. This is not coming from the book of opinions. Chapter 4, verse 31. That's 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. If you want the fire, you got to be able to stand the heat. 
If you are on fire, you're going to face the most heat from haters. Jesus said they will hate you because they hated me. If you want to be some pansy Christian who claims the same Christian as President Obama or these people who have no fruit, go somewhere else because I don't have time for it. See, we're a mission. Jack, how many people gave their hearts to Jesus on Tuesday? Seven people. Why? Because we met their physical need, which set them up to drop that bondage. I watched them give out 49 boxes of food to families of three to seven to eight people. Do you think anybody knows we're doing that? Because Jack and, and, the, and the ladies, the, the sweet ladies that are over there, I was telling Jack and Jackie, where's Wendy, is she here? Okay, so instead of saying, well, you look weird and your tattoos are weird, she said, your skin is so colorful. Now that, that is why people say, can I talk to you? Because they don't feel condemned. They don't feel forsaken and forgotten. They don't feel rotten. They feel loved and accepted, am I right, Jack? That's why they do the way they do. They sit in that uncomfortable social security feel in front room where we can't talk about Jesus. Then they go and they register and they check in and then they're offered prayer. And all of a sudden they go, yeah, you know what? Yeah. And then when Jack gets a hold of them, he doesn't, he doesn't say, well, you're going to hell. He says, hey, and I, I sat there and I listened secretly like this. And I just wanted to hear it. And he goes, what can we do for you? What are you carrying? What's going on? And he just listened. He didn't say, repeat after me, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Now some of you are all like, I really talk like that, and he keeps making fun of me. I'm not making fun of you. I'm actually making fun of some people that I know in Oklahoma that don't really talk like that, but they pretend they do to sell more cars. Anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so... Freedom from sin, strife, sickness, disease. Today is your day of freedom. Today is your independence day from the chains that bind you. I close with this, and I said that 15 minutes ago, but I really do close with this. The chains that bind you and the grip that Satan has on your life, today is your independence day. See, some of us have a Holy Spirit blockage that keeps us from freedom. Those of us who we consider ourselves to be born again or we consider ourselves to be followers, we have to ask ourselves if there are any of these Holy Spirit blocks in our path. We're going to check these out. Next one. We're at the list. I, I skipped one. I'm sorry. That's it? The Holy Spirit blocks? You didn't get that one? Okay. All right. No big deal. Here we go. These are seven examples of Holy Spirit blockages that occur for several reasons. Here they are. Number one, doubt or intellectual pride. Religious tradition. Number three, fear of the supernatural. See, some people, when they hear us say, shit, about a Honda, but I bought a Kawasaki, they freak out. And see, some of you still aren't going to get that until you get home, and they're going to go, he said, shit, about a Honda. That's funny. Number four, unconfessed sin. Number five, emotional wounds. See, sometimes you just need to let the Holy Spirit stitch you up. But you want to hold on to it so you keep picking at it. You keep bathing in Epsom salt even though you have open wounds. Sometimes you just got to go into surgery because Band-Aids aren't working. Number six, an unyielded spirit. I feel like David Letterman up here. Number seven, and this is the final one, and this is the one that Jackie actually added to this list. Anger and resentment either at God or people. She said that to me. I only had six. And when she said that, I was like, she said, you know, a lot of people just carry around. The reason they're not free is because they're just angry at God and they're angry and resentful towards people and they have unforgiveness. And guess what? Bitterness is a poison that you drink and you expect me to get sick. And that doesn't work. That's just ridiculous. So tomorrow is Independence Day, but today is the day of breakthrough. Today is the day we can break your chains and we can get free. So what I want, we're going to go into the time of communion. Communion.